What's happening, everyone? Happy Thursday. Welcome to Airbrush Down Dirty Tricks live feed. Today is 3 23. Welcome to a Thursday night feed. We're going to do something a little bit different tonight. <clears throat> I'm not going to do a crazy project like I usually do. Uh, I've been meaning to do this for a while. I did one recently on Createx um, on their colors, Createx colors page. I did just a couple basics, you know, dagger strokes, things like that, how to mix a couple colors. But in preparation for what I'm planning with, like a whole program and membership and you know, a whole instructional plan, uh, I've been really meaning to do a lot of basics, a lot of um, intro pieces, and just one on ones, troubleshooting dagger strokes, shading, basic shading, lighting, and you guys today gave some awesome. Awesome, awesome um, suggestions. So I actually put some of those into play tonight. Uh, so in a little bit, I'm going to get started. I'm going to, I might sound a little weird because I'm going to kind of voice it as if I'm not doing a live feed. Uh, but you guys are going to kind of help shape it through your questions and comments and things like that. So I can then edit these down to maybe small two to five minute clips, ten minute clips on how to do certain things. Uh, and maybe get five or six or eight videos out of this. Um, we'll see how it goes. <laughs> I'm not sure how it goes. I didn't have anything major planned out work-wise because I've been so busy. Uh, I figured this would be easy, but it turned out not to be as easy because I had to overdo it. Uh, so what I did do is um, there's a couple things. Let me show you. Uh, let me see here. Let me switch out to my other feed here. These were actually before I get going. Let me see who's here tonight. We'll talk to everyone. Say hi. We got a couple people over on Facebook. I got my mom. Hi, mom. I'm Josh Lashway. Joshua Adam Wade. Sean. Sean, awesome job buffing that bike. That I think I did that 10 years ago or 11 years ago. It's great. Joe Juice, what's going on, brother? Derek, all right, see who we got over here in the Down and Dirty Tricks is on YouTube, which is the better place to view it because Facebook kind of uh, sucks half the time, but it is what it is. We got Michael Stanton. Uh, we got Mr. Boss. We got Gary. What's going on, Gary? Uh, we got Mich Michael Cohen. What's going on, man? Michelle. Hi, Michelle. Good to see you. Uh, da -da -da -da. Gary Fantasia. Nice, finally over on Facebook, I mean on YouTube. Much better feed over here, looks a lot better, much more stable. Uh, what else we got? We got we got 32 of you here. Thank you very much for popping in. Thank you everyone for the suggestions today. Uh, so let me kind of show you what I've done. Some of you probably already had this one. I did this one a while ago. Um, this was an actual airbrush practice sheet. Let me go to camera two here. Uh, I'm going camera two. So this was a practice sheet I did a while ago. Uh, these were big in the 80s and 90s in a bunch of different magazines and guys did one. So I, I did this one a long time ago, which is dagger practice sheet, um, different sizes, different things, dots, and then line work. So this was this was a download. No, Michelle, we are doing a video tonight. So we're not going to do that. <laughs> um, so this was available my, on my uh, mckayfineart.com for quite a long time. And uh, it still is, but what I've done is I've added to this. And I've done a new one this evening. Let me see if I can bring up the, um, the next thing here. So aside from this sheet... We will have, I may have, is this, let me see if this one comes up, yeah. So we're going to do one that has the classic, the cylinders, the the sphere, the cube, a cone, a star, and just kind of go over basic shading and things like that. I did hit record, thank you very much. Uh, so that's kind of the intent tonight, is go through a lot of these basics uh, and do some troubleshooting, and then maybe I can edit these down later, uh, is kind of going to be the plan, so... Hopefully that all works out. Um, so let's talk about what I'm doing here. Okay, first thing I'm doing here is we're doing airbrush 101. This is the basics. This is how the airbrush works. What's an airbrush? What's the trigger? Basic troubleshooting things, and I want to kind of go over some things I see all the time on the net. Um, a lot of common problems, a lot of common things like that. Just getting yourself set up, that's half the battle. I think 90% of the users... Uh, go out, they buy an airbrush, they buy a compressor, they buy some paint, they stick it in, 
and it sprays like crap. Or it back bubbles, or it doesn't spray right, or they didn't they sprayed it once the first time it was great, second time they come back and it's not working well. Is it cleaning? Is it parts damage? Is it thing? There's a lot of things. So we're gonna try to cover quite a bit of it here tonight. First thing is first. Let's talk about basic airbrush operation. Uh, so what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna grab this is my Wad Eclipse. This is my workhorse gun. This is the basic airbrush I use day in, day out. Uh, it's one of the nicest universal brushes that I've used, and I've used a lot in my 33, 4 some odd years uh, of different brands, different types. This has always been my go-to workaround. Um, and not just because it's an I Wad Eclipse, but it's, it's size and configuration. I like the body size of it. I like a gravity feed gun for what I do because I do a lot of automotive, I do a lot of mural work, and I do um, some modeling and things like that. So I like the gravity feed versus the bottom. When I'm doing t-shirts and things like that, big wall murals, I use a bottom feed gun. Uh, and the difference between those two is typically these are .35 nozzle, and the siphon feeds that are free from the bottom are a .5. So the .5s are t-shirt guns because we can run those at higher pressure, thick as, thicker viscosity paint. To really get that out there for bigger areas um, and because we have a bottle on the on the bottom we can have so much more paint on demand um, you know I'll be using these two tonight so I'll be using my Eclipse uh, HPCS and I'll be using my Eclipse Takumi which is these are the same brushes all in all this one's just a side feed where the cups off to the side uh, but the nozzle and head assembly are the same and they work pretty much identical okay so uh, let's just kind of go over the airbrush itself so what I'm running here is, like I said, I want Eclipse, 0.35 nozzle, basic double action airbrush. And um, I have a studio size compressor, which operates great, you know, up to about, I can steadily run this to about 45, well, about 55 PSI I can run this. So, so I can run paint straight through this without really any reduction, especially what I'm using tonight is Createx Colors paint. Um, and I've done a little bit of reduction to it, but when you're running high pressure to 0.35, you can run straight out of the bottle. And I'm going to show you some differences on that work. So this is, I might have 5% reducer in this, and this is at 45 PSI. So I'm just going to push down the trigger. And when you push down the trigger, it's very loud, and you're gonna, just going to get air. And I'm going to pull back the trigger. I'm not going to move. I'm just going to actually, I'm going to use my finger here as just kind of a balance point. You don't have to. Or you can. You don't have to. You can. And what I'm going to do is I am just going to rock the trigger back and put it forward and I'm going to look at it. Okay, you can see it dry. And what I see, it's, it's a nice atomization, it's a nice dot. I can get really close, I can get nice little dots. I can get further away. I can get bigger dots. I can be really further away. But what I'm noticing, if you look really, really close, I'll see if I can zoom in here is it's a little grainy and gravelly, okay? Uh, and I'm at, I'm at high pressure. Um, so let me show you what low pressure does, and you're gonna see a very similar reaction. It's actually gonna get worse. Uh, this is kind of a misnomer. Some people think less pressure is better, more is, you know, for thicker. It doesn't work like that. Airbrushes are not hydraulically pushed. You're not actually pushing the paint from behind. You're actually pulling the paint off the nozzle. The air is actually coming up here, and it's actually creating a suction and drawing it like a straw out of the airbrush and pulling it. It's not pushing it. So it's very different than a hydraulic. So let me go down. I'm going to go down to like a lot of small compressors will do about 30 to 35 PSI. So let me show you what that looks like. When you're doing 30, 35 PSI, the same thing. I'm going to pull back the three the same amount. And it looks very similar. And get really close. And that's kind of fine. What we're going to notice here, the, it starts getting even more gravelly. It just, it's not really smooth. Um, and that's kind of the problem, is, is it's just really not atomizing well, okay? And the key is to get good atomization. So how do we fix that? Well, there's a couple ways. Um, if I was up at a, I want to eclipse um, the bottom feed, the bottom feed, I could go to 60 PSI, that's got a 0.5, that would smooth out the gravel because it's coming through a wider nozzle, it won't have to st uh, stress to go through it. 
Um, especially this being, you know, the Createx, the, the standard Createx colors, which is, you know, the Wicked line, which is for, can be anywhere from airbrushing, t-shirts, to uh, wall murals, to fine art, depending on how you utilize it out of the airbrush. Um, now, this, like I said, this is a .35. If I went to a point, you know, a Micron type brush or a .23, it, it, it would get even worse with this pressure. Um, so what I'm going to do to smooth this out is I'm going to add a little bit more reducer. So reducer, thinners, depending on your paint. I'm going to add a little bit more. And I'm going to take a second to get kind of acclimated. It takes a little bit. you got to shake it through. you got to remember whatever paint you have, whatever paint you have in your airbrush, what you've been spraying, that's still in here. So when, even though you'll mix it here, getting it through here is going to take a little bit. So you're definitely going to want to spray that out into a pot. You actually, you actually kind of hear it change. It'll actually sound a little smoother. So now I'm going to go back up. This is still at that 35 psi. It's still a little bit, but it's getting smoother. You just kind of let it work its way through. Sometimes a nice mixing brush is good because you can actually just kind of stir it and mix it up. Now I'm going to go a little higher. I'm going to go up to 40. And this is where it's personal. So depending how you paint, you're going to find it's better at higher pressure, lower pressure, depending how you move. So there's definitely not a one size fits all to this. So now what I'm noticing, it's much smoother, it's less gravelly. Now you got to be careful on slick materials like this. If it gets too wet, it'll actually blow out on you. Um, it'll actually do this. Let me see if I can. Let me see if I can get a nice blowout. Not too much on paper because it kind of soaks in. Let me come over here to the metal panel, and you'll see this is metal. It'll actually spider a little bit more. And if it's really thin, it'll spider even more. So there's definitely a balancing act and something you will get more proficient at as you go through. And you kind of find your sweet spot for your reduction versus air pressure versus how far you fast you move. Uh, so that's definitely something you want to take into consideration. So let's... Okay, we got that kind of where we want it. I'm going to get a fresh, clean piece of paper here. And this is paper is a great, cheap way to practice. Um, if you're going to go in for t-shirt art, I would recommend paper towels. They, probably, they kind of soak up similar. Um, paper, I find, is actually very similar to sanded automotive. I mean, it does hold the paint a little bit better, um, but you will get some skating of the paint, so... Let's see. So now if you notice, when I'm doing these large, I'm not getting that gravelly spitting. Oh, I probably shouldn't have destroyed this one. <laughs> so these were really gravelly around the outside. There was actually like little dry specks. But you don't get that here because it's much wetter. Okay. And again, what I'm doing is just I'm just practicing that basic, simple dots. I know everyone's done dots and you've seen it, but I'm going to explain why I do dots, okay? This is why I do the daggers and dots and things like that with an airbrush, okay? And I'm going to get through it a little bit more clear in the next part, but let's just talk about here as far as what I'm looking for when this happens. What you're looking for in a dot is a nice, even atomization, it should be round, it should not be gravelly, and you don't want it blowing out on you. That's kind of what you want. That's kind of your perfect, you know your brush is working well, you know your paint's thinned well, it's feeling good, the trigger reaction is good. And this is what you want before you attack a painting, okay? You don't want to go in and attack a painting with a bad airbrush mixture, bad paint mixture, dirty gun, whatever. If you do, if you're straight on like this, and you pull back, 
and you get something that looks like this. It's kind of oddball shaped. This is caused by two things, usually. It's either a bent needle, so the needle's got a little hook in it. So what's happening is the paint, instead of coming straight, it's going straight and getting deflected off like this. And it's creating an oddball shape. If it looks, I'm going to kind of draw this animated. If it looked like this, it's kind of hooked like that. This could also be two things. Either your fluid nozzle, the nozzle itself is kind of crimped to the top. And it's, it's you know, paint is only coming out of half of the nozzle instead of the whole nozzle. It's creating kind of a crescent shape. Um, th that could be a big reason. If you're getting this, let's talk about this because I see this all the time. I'm going to see if I can get the brush to do it. All right, everyone look in the bowl here. Anyone get this problem? It's bubbling, okay? Bubbling is a big problem that happens. And this is usually happens for multiple reasons, okay? So it, you notice it right now it's doing it, just when my air is on, it's still bubbling. Okay, the reason why in this case it's doing it is my whole head assembly is loose and it's not fully tightened up. See right here? It's actually loose. And if it's backed off too much or the fluid cap or the nozzle is backed out too much, it'll cause the same problem because everything's not lined up and the air, instead of drawing through, is creating back pressure and the back pressure is going up through and creating bubbles. And if it was a bottom feed, it would do the same thing. It would put bubbles into your cup. Very simple fix. Tighten everything up. And now you should have no problem spraying. That is the most common. There's another thing that's happening here. Uh, I'm going to pause there for a second. This would be good for video edit. Uh, another issue that happens, okay, when we're spraying, and it's not a problem right now, but notice what's happening when I'm pushing air. I'm not actually pulling the trigger back. I'm still getting air. I'm still getting paint. What that means is I'm not seating well. So around the... Let me take... I just want to take the air cap off, but not the full nozzle. Sorry about this. Let me just get a little proper tool here to do this. Hold, please. So let's get back to this. Okay, so the other common problem you're having, if you start having this problem, we, we know our cap's tight here. I just pulled the actual air cap off. This is mainly just for overspray and to keep you from bending the needle. You can't operate the airbrush with it off. If you do, however, and you touch your needle to the surface, you'll probably bend it. But what's happening is I'm getting paint when I just push air down. So two things. Sometimes it's really simple. On the nozzle itself, if that needle is not seated all the way through and making a complete seal on the nozzle, a little bit of paint will sneak by. 9% of the time, you can pull the nozzle cap off like this, because it might be just a little dry paint here. Around the needle, not letting it seat properly. And when it doesn't seat properly, it creates that problem. It's still doing it. So what I do now, basic troubleshooting. Aside from breaking down the whole gun, pull off the, the handle. I'll loosen the needle chuck, and I'll just kind of spin and pull the needle back a little bit. In and out, but don't draw it all the way out. Our paint's going to go all the way down here, and you don't want that. And I'm going to kind of spin it 
And now I'm going to see all good. Like a nice old dots. There just might have been a little bit of debris or a little bit of dried paint because as air goes over the paint, it can dry paint around the nozzle. A little buildup happens and you're not getting an efficient spray. Okay. That's usually the case 90% of the time. So the basic troubleshooting is you make sure your whole head assembly needs to be snug, not over tight, just snug. You want to make sure it's clean. You want to make sure from the front looking at it, your needle passage and nozzle passage is clear so airflow can go through it and your, your needle is seating right. Those are the most common problems. Other issue that happens, a lot of people overlook. This is issue uh, number five, I would say, on the list. Right here, okay? I do this a lot where I put my hand, my finger over the, the vent and I shake it, okay? And over time, paint will build up here. And what will happen, I wanna, I'm gonna do is I'm gonna simulate this, see if we can catch it on camera. I'm just gonna block this off and we'll paint for a bit. And everything's fine for quite a while actually. And what starts to happen, we start getting delays, meaning I'm pulling the trigger back and I'm not, the trigger is not as responsive. I'm not getting as much pain as I had been getting. It's not as thorough. Let's see if I can force it a little bit. And it's just not quite right. What's happening is here, you need a little bit of that vent to draw air in to balance out the air pressure and siphoning going out. Okay, so it needs to be a nice loop. Bottom feeds have the same thing. The bottom feed brushes have a little vent to the side. They will get plugged up and it just it makes things flow improperly. Okay. Those are your basics. Those are the, what you want to go through. You want to mess with your air pressure up or down. You want to thin the paint based on your surface, whether you want it to not blow out too much or you want it just, you know, smooth spray. And you're looking for nice smooth atomization. I'm going to talk about lines. I want to talk about movement. But you want things to be nice and subtle. Uh, I have this reduced now nice for flow and coverage. If you're going to do fine art and things are a little more delicate, I'm going to actually reduce it a little bit more so it's even thinner. I'm going to drop the pressure down and that will allow it to be even finer spray for shading. We're going to talk about that through the rest of it. Let's get a fresh piece of paper. i got to stop damaging those. I should be saving these. <laughs> okay. Now that we know our brush is working well. Okay. We know it's working well. Let's talk about how an airbrush actually works. Okay. These are double action airbrushes versus single. Single action airbrush basically would mean if I push on the trigger, like it was stationary here, I get paint every time I pull the trigger back. It just always, there's always paint. Okay. That's how a single action works. Double action is you push down, you get air only. You should get no paint. If you're getting paint at this point, go back to the prior step and figure out what the problem is because it's usually a little jam up. It's trigger down for air, off, on, off. That's it. That's all this does. This is not, I'm going to repeat this a few times. This is not variable. This is a trigger. It's on or off on or off. It does seem like if you push down just a little bit, you get a little air, and it does. But it's impossible to maintain that. It's not designed for that. It's not variable. It's on or off. Okay? And then what you're going to do is you pull back. The more you pull back, the more you pull back the trigger, the more volume of paint comes out. So let's talk about that. So here, I'm about a lower inch away. I'm going to do a half trigger pull. Half trigger pull, I start to get a little blowout. I'm gonna do less of that. And I get these nice dots. Now if I go further away in that same trigger pull, I get dots that are more faint. Why is it more faint? Because it's the same volume of paint coming out but at a different distance. So less of it's actually getting to the surface, more of it's going in the air. Same thing here, same thing. If I go back a little, I'm doing that same trigger pull, it's even more faint. 
if I get super close, trigger pull, I should get really bold dots. Okay, much sharper and, you know, right on. But that's all the same trigger pull. Now let's do a lot of trigger pull. I'm gonna get real close. I'm gonna do almost probably three quarter trigger pull. Look at that. I'm getting blowouts, okay? Because I got too much paint coming out too fast, it's too wet, it's blowing out. This becomes more apparent on slick surfaces, like this. Uh, there are cases when you can utilize this in paint jobs. Back in the day, we used to call these freak dots. Uh, there was a bunch of names for them. Um, I've used them in some paintings, but that's not the point of this. <laughs> but now watch, that same trigger pull from a distance, I don't get the blowouts. I'm getting a nice gradient fade and even coverage, okay? So distance makes a huge difference along with trigger pull. And when we get to practice sheets, you're gonna play with this distance quite a bit. Okay, and that's gonna make a big difference when, I'm gonna do the walk, I'm gonna do this, same trigger pull, but as I move, I'm gonna move uh, across the surface. I'm gonna start far away, I'm gonna get closer. Okay, but I'm not gonna change the amount of trigger. So here, I get a nice fade. As I get closer, it gets thinner and bolder. Okay, this is a very rudimentary way we do dagger strokes. We're gonna talk about that quite a bit. It's, it has to do with trigger pull and things like, things like movement and speed. What it's also doing is, when I'm doing a row of dots like this, there's one thing I'm doing that usually isn't apparent to most people. And what is that? That is I'm leaving the air on the whole time. So let me show you what happens when you don't leave the air on the whole time. This would be a nice edit point. Thank you everyone for checking this out. I'm gonna clip this out when I do the actual shorts, but uh, uh, let's do this. You know, my goal here is to get a lot of footage uh, because I have multiple cameras running that we can edit these down later. Uh, so I am kind of looking up at your comments and things you guys are saying and shout out any ideas or comments or things that you're missing because it might make better video later if if I'm not covering something. Um, you know, trying to do this live, I do have a little sheet in front of me with what I want to hit uh, in order. So I'm trying to hit everything. But if I miss something, um, we'll have to post edit it later. But I'm trying not to. So uh, I'm going to have a little drink of water here. Water tonight uh, because I'm working. This is work. <laughs> All right, let's get back to it. <clears throat> I'm going to switch you guys out to... Oops. Let's switch you guys to camera three for a little bit. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Fresh piece of paper here. Let's talk about why you want the air on all the time. So when I do a row of dots and I, I'm in one position, I pull back, rock forward, pull back, rock forward, pull back, rock forward, and I keep doing that. and I get nice, consistent row of dots, okay? And it's not perfect, perfect, but if you want perfect, I can use grid paper. Now, if I don't leave the trigger on, I'm gonna show you what happens. I'm gonna do one dot, and I'm gonna go off. It's very hard to see. I'm gonna see if we can zoom in here on one of the cameras. Uh, doo -doo 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 -doo. So watch what happens. I'm gonna pull the trigger back, and before I move, I'm gonna let up on the trigger. And now when I push the trigger again, I get paint. So I get here, I'm off, 
like a little bit of paint. A little bit of spit. See that? What's happening is I'm pushing the trigger down, I'm pulling it, and right before I should be closing it off, go to the next line, I'm lifting up. And what that's doing, it's leaving a little dollop of paint on the end of the needle. So my, it's basically doing this. I'm going to force this one. So if I pull the trigger back, because the gravity feed, and I now I push the air, see, I get a dot. If I was to pull back a lot, watch. Lots of paint. Now you could utilize this, why I've utilized this in the past for different effects. Works awesome for doing star fields and things like that. But uh, it's really apparent when you start doing dagger strokes and if you're doing this, you're, you're, they're just not as, they won't be as refined and you're, the chances you'll get a bunch of this stuff. You get a bunch of little um, mist paints. So air on, air on is the key, okay? So this is just the basic, 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 basic intro. How the airbrush works. This is what you want to do. You don't want it gravelly. You want nice smooth atomization. You want to hear it. It should just be smooth. And that air all the time really helps you when you do daggers or you're doing fades or you're doing blends like, you know, let's see here. I'm just going to flip this over. So if I'm coming off to the side, I'm doing a nice blend. It'll be nice and even. But what I'm also doing, and we're going to talk about this, is my air is on, but my paint is off when I come back to the second direction. So I'm leaving the air on, but I am stopping the paint flow. Why am I doing that? If I keep the paint on the whole time and go back and forth, I get dumbbells. Because the paint goes here, and then doubles back on itself because I'm not shutting the paint off at the end of the line. So we'll, we'll I got some practice drills that'll work that out uh, in the next part. So this is what you're looking for. You're just looking for those nice basic dots and we'll just do a nice sheet of them and then I'll show you a nice little way to practice them. And a few other strokes to practice. So what I do, especially when I first start, I kind of use my pinky or you can use a knuckle depending on your distance. Airbrush should be kind of square to the surface. Okay, so I'm just getting air so I'm looking for. I did have a little issue. The paint came out. I'm just gonna fix that. So we're gonna do a dot. You wanna move about an inch, do another dot, do another dot, do another dot. This is great practice. That's a little closer there. What this is helping you do is kind of get in spatial relation to distance and flow. The more you do this, the more muscle memory this will teach. Because then what we're going to do is that same process. We're going to connect those lines by going dot, and we're going to move, and we're going to close. So basically what I'm doing is I'm going airs on, paint pulls back, I move, and I close the paint. I move, I close the paint. I move, close the paint, move, close the paint. And it's repetitive, but I try different directions. And the more you do this, the better you'll get, but I have a nicer way to do these drills, and I'm gonna do that the next part. And so, stick with me for the next part, and we'll move on from there onto the average practice sheet. And it's just a nice way to be a little bit more strategic with it. So we're going to go there. All right. So that is, I think that's good enough for like basic, basic. Um, I do plan on doing some videos on like breaking the airbrush down and cleaning it and things like that. So we've talked about that. Um, but that was just more about getting the paint to spray well. And I think I should get some good enough footage out of that. Uh, hello Gerald, how are you sir? We are doing Airbrush Basics 101 tonight, so basically I figured I would do this live, but record all the footage for editing later, and I'll take breaks in between, and then, you know, get some feedback, and see what we can do with this stuff for later. Alright. 
next part. This is an airbrush practice sheet I created in Photoshop a long time ago, and this was on my store for a while. You could download, and then I took it off. Okay. Um, but it's back up and available along with the next part of this video. So, all right. So we've done the basics on how the airbrush works itself. Now, if you want to get a little bit more strategic, you want to practice, get a little bit more targeted and try different things to, to do everything exactly the way every time. I created this downloadable sheet. You can print this however you want it. And basically, this is this first part here we're going to talk about is just practicing dots. And I did a little explanation. Is aim at the cross section of the grid and rock the trigger back and back and forward to achieve a uniform dot. Work from both left to right, right to left, uh, bottom to top. And we'll, we'll talk about that. So basically what I'm doing here, I'm going to try to stay consistent with this. And man, I haven't done this in a long time myself, so we're going to see how this goes. Uh, this is a 12 by 18 print. And you can print it in any color. And go from there. This is a great practice sheet for really kind of dialing in and seeing if you can basically, it's basically target practice. How much trigger pull achieves that line, that perfect dot. And I can keep going. And can I keep it uniform? This download is available on mckayfineart.com, part of the Airbrush Basic 101 section, um, along with um, another practice sheet. So basically that was nice and uniform. I'm gonna do the next row. And this is the same trigger pull really, but I'm just closer. I'm about, I split the difference in half. So these are nice. Dots. Nice and even. Let me do another row up here, the same size. Basic target practice. And uh, so now you have this whole other area you can do, you can try it again. Maybe try a different distance at a different size. When I was doing it early days, and uh, I did a magazine a while ago where someone had a great tip, was basically just get a roll of paper towels, cheap paper towels, or cheap paper, put a little like adhesive, like a little spray adhesive on a board, stick it, and just practice sheets of these. And there was a theory, and I believe it's accurate, if you got through an entire roll of bounty paper towels and practiced this from start to finish, by the time you got done, your muscle memory, your trigger control would be pretty much set at that point. Uh, and if you looked at your beginning dots and daggers to your end ones, you would notice a marked difference. And it's kind of that 10,000 stroke method. Okay, uh, so that's the top row. The second row is the same thing, but it's different distances, okay? So we're going to start small, do small trigger pull, and as I go through, I'm doing varying trigger pulls and distances, okay? I'm doing different trigger pulls and distances to show you how that affects the line. See that? I was pretty much doing a very similar trigger pull, maybe a little bit more when I got to here, but I was further away. Okay, see if I can duplicate that without the guide. Okay, this is 
really great to just really get that muscle memory, practice keeping that trigger down, making sure your paint flow is consistent, even, and your airbrush is working well. That's the benefit to doing the dots, okay? It's more about, is my paint reduced properly? Is my airbrush working well? Is everything good? Am I ready to go? Do I have my, my muscles loosened up? Am I ready to go achieve that artwork? Great practice to do, even if you're doing like 30 seconds of it, five seconds of it before you start a painting off to the side of a piece of paper. This is valuable. I've been doing this since 1989 and I still do this off to the side. So yes, always practice uh, your dots and daggers. And I'm gonna talk about dagger strokes, which is the next stroke of the next part. Okay, and that is just gonna make sure everything's working well. The last thing you wanna do is just go cold and do a painting, throw the paint in the brush, turn the air on, and just go paint and have, you know, your paint spits. It's not quite right, it's not reduced, there's a problem. That's what you don't want to happen, and that's what these drills will avoid from happening in the future. So whether you download this or not, or create your own and make your own, get graph paper, regular paper, toilet paper, bunch of paper towels, doesn't matter. Just practice something and make sure that airbrush is working well and get that finger loosened up and trained. All right, that's gonna go a long way. Um, and you're gonna solve 90% of your problems at this stage, whether it's paint reduction, air pressure, broken part, poor maintenance, a defective airbrush, water in your lines, whatever could happen, you want it to happen here, not on the canvas. So I hope this helps and we will move on to the next stage. Cut. <laughs> so that's kind of what I've been doing. So I think that little section will make a nice video. I think it'll be a nice, you know, five or ten minute uh, how to. And uh, yeah, so that's kind of what I'm doing here. Uh, before I go to the next part, I'm going to actually go back to paper and just show a couple of things like that. Um, but feel free to give you some suggestions, talk about what you're doing. Uh, nice baby, what else am I applying? Flat vinyl. Yep, uh, AJ, that's definitely gonna come at some point. We'll talk about vinyl application. Uh, I've actually got quite a few of those videos I did a while back and I, I could probably, I think they're actually on my YouTube channel, but I'll see if I can kind of re-edit and refresh those back to the top. Um, so I talk about that quite a bit, but yeah, I can definitely make some videos. What I really need to do is hire someone who's really good at video editing to go through the hundreds of hours of videos I have. And we could probably make dozens to hundreds of videos uh, for YouTube with that. So that's kind of the plan. Off to the side, we'll edit this out. I do have a drink. Shh. Oh, the fun of editing. <laughs> Thank you for popping in, Gerald. Thank you for everyone for popping in. We got 53 on here. We got a couple over on Facebook. Yeah, let's see. Okay. All right, so we did the basic dots. We did the basic you know, is the airbrush working well? Let's talk about the next big stroke. And I'll show you a few different ways to practice it. Is the dagger stroke. And the dagger stroke was kind of like what I was doing here. But I was going, you know, these the, these are kind of just, I don't want to call them a dagger stroke or rat tail because they're kind of uniform. What a dagger stroke is, is this. It's a thick to thin, line and what I'm doing to achieve this is I'm pulling the trigger back I'm moving and as I'm moving I'm slowly closing the trigger and sometimes I'm actually getting these gotta look really shaky I'm coming in and I'm pulling the trigger back and I'm getting closer a lot of times and the more I do this and honestly the faster I do this the more uniform they can become. Okay, 
Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna run through this on the practice sheet and be a little more strategic. But the goal is to do these in different directions. And that's gonna help train your muscle memory to move any direction. So again, it's you normally do dot move dot and you close in between. So dot close, dot close, dot close. This is dot move close, dot move close, dot move close, dot move close, dot move close. Okay? But I'm doing it while I'm getting closer. Okay. This is something you gotta practice a lot. And another way you can do it just to kind of train yourself. Let's see what I can do on this side. I can edit this out. Thanks, Dave. Appreciate it. I won't be doing a lot of these tonight. Well, I will actually. I just have to find a break point. I can edit out later. Thank you. So if I don't do it right away, don't feel bad. But I really, really, really appreciate it. Okay. Now I can edit this back in. Three, two, one. So if you want to practice that, you can do it while you move. Because see how I'm doing this? And I'm moving, closing, moving, closing, moving, closing, moving, closing. But I'm stopping. Just go all the way across and pull the trigger back, forth, back, forth, and watch. You're naturally getting dagger strokes because you're moving and rocking the trigger back if you do it really fast. You can get these really cool effects. We'll talk about those used in future paintings, but done this a lot for water effects back in the day. Or you do like little dagger strokes. But these have to take practice. But the dagger stroke next to the dot is, in my opinion, actually more important than the dot, but it's, you know, on par. It's the first two you really have to learn aside from, you know, paint atomization. Okay? So that's bare bones basic. Again, this is going to help you with your airbrush. Is it working well? Is it not working well? Is your paint reduced well? Is it not reduced? You know, because everything should just work smoothly at that point. You're looking for smooth flow is what you're looking for at that stage. Okay? So let's go to the practice sheet and see what we get from there. All right. Practice number two. If you saw my other video on quick, this is kind of a continuation of that. We're going to be more strategic with this. I'm going to zoom back out. And for my friends watching live, I'm going to switch to this one. So on this sheet, and if you want to, you could just like print out a bunch of these or just get graph paper practicing yourself. What I'm trying to do here is short dagger strokes in different directions, okay? So I'm trying to go one, two, three. And my air is staying on, and I'm, I'm actually starting to move a little bit first before I pull the trigger back. And then I'm continuing to follow through, okay? I'm continuing to follow through while the air is on, but I'm shutting the paint off. So even though this is my start and stop point, I'm coming in from here, air's on, paint's on right there, paint's off, but I'm following through with my line. Okay, and the more you practice it, the better you get at it, more strategic. So that's kind of what this sheet is for. So we're going from right to left, top to bottom, left to right, bottom to top. And that's going to help build muscle memory to go in different directions. Now, me as an airbrush artist, I do motorcycles and cars, so I can't just flip the canvas over or flip it around to make it more comfortable. So you have to be able to work in all directions. And this is going to help 
that's top to bottom, left to right, bottom to top. Repeat, left to right, bottom to top. right to left, top to bottom. I would recommend doing sheets of this. Just sheets and sheets. This is gonna really be how you kind of really tone that muscle memory in, because I can do them really small. See that? We can see if we can go even smaller. This is no micron. This is just a standard airbrush. We can get really, really close here. Try it at all different distances, sizes. You could even do some angles and you can really mess around with it. But this, I, because I'm getting this close, that's why I pulled the cap off. It allows me to get a little closer, but I'm not touching with the needle. And I'm actually using my hand as a rest. And you can see, just watch, just, we'll go up to our previous step here. Watch how tight you can get these dots. Let's see how many I can get. This is how you know your airbrush is working really, really good. I could probably, let's see if I can go even smaller. That's probably about the limit. But this is a .35 nozzle. They do make smaller ones so you can get tighter. But 90% of your work, this is gonna do the job. That's why I don't recommend going out of the gate and buying a $400, $600, $700 dollar airbrush or even a $250, $300 one at that point. Nice $80 to $100, $150 brush. These will work forever and last forever. And consistent. This brush here is probably about 25 years old. And it just keeps on ticking. And so that is basic daggers, dots, everything you can do with the practice sheet. The last part of this sheet is kind of longer single lines. They're basically elongated dagger strokes. And what I have written down here is, I wrote this so long ago, it's very horrible. Practice longer single lines. To achieve a uniform line, start moving in one direction with the air on, gradually lock the trigger back, maintain the desired line thickness. End the line, rock the trigger forward, and continue to follow through with the air on. And that's what I mean, you're gonna follow through. Okay, these you can do at different distances. What I recommend is practicing without paint first and just kind of working that uh, muscle memory, okay? Just and seeing if I can figure it out. So here's air, paint, air. But I'm gonna start here. So I'm gonna come across this, probably gonna be horrible. Let's see. I'm gonna come across and I'm gonna about this close, I'm about a half an inch. I'm going to paint, air off, paint off, air on, okay, I went a little bit beyond, Let's go back this way, that's basically what I'm trying for, it's that flow, and if you look at me, when I'm doing this, I'm using my whole upper body, I'm not locked in with my arm only like a robot. I'm actually using my shoulders and my chest and I'm actually rocking my back and I'm going across the whole surface. And that's kind of what you want to do, especially ahead of time before you actually paint, okay? These last two, I'm just gonna do the same thing, but from a distance, I can actually do it twice. Get a nice gradient fade. Okay, this, that's basically what you want. And if you can do this and everything's working good and you're kind of targeting everything the way you want it, you can start painting some imagery. I'm gonna talk about imagery next. 
I'm going to talk about other strokes that you can do and other quick drills you can do. But all the next ones I'm going to talk about stem off, I don't want to say, I hate the term mastering, but being proficient or developing the muscle memory for these strokes will lend themselves to everything else you're ever going to paint. Okay, and understanding how the airbrush works and making sure the paint's slowing right and everything else. I can't stress enough, practice these stages because it's going to help you in the long run. I don't care how talented you are as an artist, how good you are as an artist, or, or how you can draw or create. If your tools are not working properly, and everything's just going to fall to pieces. You may be able to compensate around it, but it's not going to be your ideal experience. So practice these. I promise you, the more you practice it, the more to become second nature. And you never even have to worry about the stuff that will just become natural. And everything you want to paint will just work out because you're no longer worrying about, so is my air pressure right? Is my paint right? Is my airbrush okay? Is it work? That stuff's going to go away because you're going to develop enough me blah, sorry. You're going to develop enough, enough muscle memory where there's no question anymore. You just pick up a brush and paint. All right, so practice these drills on paper, whatever you want. Download this if you choose. And I guarantee you, with enough practice, this will just become second nature. And we'll move on to the next stage. <sighs> All right, taking a break. Let's take a break. How was that? Was that all right? I think we can use most of that, or quite a bit of that. Um, you know, I said I wanted to do this for a while. I just haven't. And the ones I've done at Craytex and Coast have been great, but they were always, for me, a little bit rushed. I kind of wanted to do a little bit more um, of my own, and then I can edit it and tweak it the way I want later. So let me see what we got here. Right, I got Mac Mac D, dots are king. Yep, dagger strokes are just dot motion exactly. It's just over on its Facebook and wow, the quality of both image and the sound is a lot better here on YouTube. Exactly, Max. That's why, you know, it's different. It's so different, and and it makes absolutely no sense why it's different because it's coming out of the same hardware. My system is all hardware based, so. Everything getting to the net is clean, pure, and set up for, basically it just thinks it's a webcam. And the reason, and Facebook just chokes it. Uh, but here it's clean, crisp, and it's more high def. Loud. Um, thank you very much, Michael Cohen. Much appreciated. That helps a lot with these because obviously I'm not auctioning this off <laughs> um, but I'm hoping we get a lot of use out of these videos down the road and uh, edit these out and they're going to be cool I'm thinking they're going to be really cool so let's get on to the next part I think the next part I'm going to kind of go uh, backtrack just a bit and do some other uh, quick basic drills that you can do based that kind of stem off those uh, let me get back to here let me switch everything up to here and we go there and this whole system allows me to do this live but when I record this stuff all four cameras well three cameras and all the video sources are recording at the same time um, and that's allowing me to be able to do all this at once okay so let's talk about a few basic basic drills that you can stem from those prior ones Okay, so we did the dots. We did the daggers, okay? Let's talk about another dagger stroke that's a little bit different, but it's the same. And this is the pinwheel. I've done this in other videos before. And basically, it's a dagger. You know, we, the daggers are like this. Different directions, right? Pinwheels of just giving a little half moon motion. So I'm going kind of down to the right. Now this one I can go up to the right. These are really great to practice. Uh, you can star them instead of curving them. 
You can go like this. Uh, these we used to do back in the t-shirt days, which are long. And then we do a couple of short ones here. And then you do a little fade stroke right in the middle. That's how you do those kind of stars. Um, these will also go into palm trees. We'll talk about that quick. Um, but when we did like beach scenes, it's basically a series of dagger strokes. I'm just going to do a really cheap one here. So I'm going to do a long, these long fade strokes, right, that we did. And I'm kind of going to do, I'm going to do just kind of sketch out where the kind of sun was going to come from. And here, watch, 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 watch. This is quick stenciling. Paper. Cup. I'm going to just blow a little fade around it, All right? And then I'm going to do, remember those wiggle strokes I was doing where I was doing dagger strokes like this? Watch. It's basically a series of dagger strokes, but I'm just going through the motion, and I can kind of do them on a fade. And look, it kind of looks like the ocean. And then I can do a little island off to one side with a dagger stroke up, and I can do a bunch of little dagger strokes coming down. Little dagger strokes, different directions. Some little dagger strokes up here. And we'll do a couple little birds. All that is, is some simple dagger strokes. And you can do some like bigger ones. These are like big palm trees. Just big dagger strokes. And it's that same method. Just little curves. Notice my air is never going off and I'm rotating, pulling the trigger back. Obviously this on a t-shirt or fabric would look a lot better, but why waste money on t-shirts when you're just practicing? Paper works just fine. We'll do a second one. And there'll be some grass down here. Okay, it's really rudimentary, it's very basic, but that is the quick power of the dagger stroke, okay? Just doing simple things like that. Now I'm gonna talk about some more continuous ones really quick, and uh, we'll move on to the next phase. Another thing you could do, muscle memory, dagger stroke, but don't close it off as quick, is a circle. What I'm doing is I'm not closing it and getting closer. So if I was to close it and get closer, I would get that. It would kind of loop and get tight. I'm kind of keeping it softer. And I'm doing different sizes. Another really great quick technique to practice. Okay. And do that from different distances. Great for doing dragon scales. So if you do a dragon scales, you can kind of oblong them. And now we can do, we'll talk about some shading in a little bit. We'll talk about that in a future video. And for my last trick, <laughs> my last trick and I'll do more of these but I don't want to overwhelm the bare bones basics okay 
how I was doing when I was doing this. This is kind of a manipulation of the trigger. Doing this is the same. I'm kind of doing thick to thin, thick to thin. Um, back as a t-shirt artist, we did this a lot when you're doing lettering and it's that thick to thin script. So my practice was this. You can just keep it, keep the trigger at one position and just move different in and out differences. And you'll get kind of a variable line width. Um, if you vary the trigger a lot, you can get thick to thin. And you can also do this. Different directions. I'm gonna cover this more extensively later on. Um, you know that far, but these are all things you can practice to make sure your airbrush is working really well, or really, 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 really well. And that should cover most of the basics that we did with this. Hope you enjoyed that basic airbrush 101. Get on painting. And if there's any troubleshooting tips you need, message me on Facebook, Instagram, and things like that. And we'll see if we can troubleshoot some videos and make sure everyone's uh, up to par and running. All right, let's move on. This is where, all right, so I'm off that. Let's say hi to everyone. Gary, thank you very much, my friend. Appreciate that. So what did Scott Voss said? This is where I have trouble, oh, too jerky. Yeah, and honestly, so Scott, what that is, use your wrist more and your shoulders more, okay? So you wanna be, if you're locked in like this, you get kind of jerky. You wanna use your wrist a little bit, and I kinda use this, my left, I'm, I'm a righty, so I use my left to stabilize my arm, and that lets my hand move. And that'll kind of change the flow. It also frees up my shoulders, so my shoulders will move. And I can keep things really consistent. But if you're locked into, like, a really tight position, it's really hard to keep nice, smooth, consistent line work. All right? So that might help. So give that a shot. All this paper. Dalton, that was a huge help. Good, man. I appreciate that. And, you know, guys, let me know if this if you think this is helpful. If it's not helpful, uh, if I'm just talking to myself, because I could go do other shit. <laughs> um, but, I, been, like I said, I've been wanting to kind of do this for a while and get some really good footage. Um, and the recordings are going well. So we should have some good footage out of this. <clears throat> It was an hour and 10 minutes. That was a little bit longer than I thought. We are going to get into our next thing. I'm going to do a quick intro here. Just kind of see how I work on video. Blah, 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 blah. I'm just going to start over. Three, two, one. How's it going, everyone? Scott McKay here. Blah. Blooper reel. <laughs> How's it going, everyone? Scott McKay here. Airbrush Down Dirty Tricks. We are going to do another quick tip basics 101 video. This is going to be on shading. Uh, one of the tips and requests I've gotten through my Facebook page and other channels as far as uh, what to do for some how-to videos was basic shading. Okay, so I want to talk about shading, light sourcing, and things like that. And the best way I could figure to do it was the basic shapes. You know, how to shade a ball, a cube, a cylinder, things like that. Some uh, semi-three-dimensional objects to really push and pull that distance. And I think that's gonna really help you guys develop bigger artwork later. I know with me as an airbrush artist, uh, mostly doing motorcycle work, um, but even in my fine art world, knowing how light reacts to hard and soft objects, uh, directional light, secondary lighting, uh, how to push and pull depth in color, 
makes a huge difference in all facets of either custom paint or fine art. Um, <coughs> For me, in custom paint with motorcycles, it's really helped me push the depth of like a flame job or tribal graphics or just these crazy graphic designs that really add depth. So I think you'll find this very helpful. Um, we're gonna get this thing started. This download is also available in my Basics 101 on mckayfineart.com. Uh, it's a two-part package. It comes with my airbrush practice sheet and this sheet that has uh, the, the circle, square, cube, all that stuff will go through this video and uh, it's very helpful. And if it's something you, you don't have a plotter, don't download, you can print them and hand cut them. Um, and if you don't want to download them, you don't want to spend the five bucks on it, this is basic, this is rudimentary. Uh, you can do this yourself on paper and draw it and hand cut it with some uh, with a compass and everything else. But the premise still stays the same. Um, so I hope you check out the how-to and we'll go from there. Blah. <laughs> That's how I do on film, typically. <clears throat> so anyone who's filming me, I might use a stammer at front, but I usually try to get it out the gate. Uh, I'm going to get a couple things for this next part. I can't juggle. <laughs> Dalton, see what Dalton said here. Uh, you know, sorry, pinstripe. You know, pinstripe is a whole nother ball game. <laughs> um, I can do it, kind of. I'll, I'll leave it at that. Um, but um, <clears throat> before I get too far into that, I get some water. I'm gonna clean my easel up. This is the magic of editing, because I can put all this stuff Oh, You won't even see it later when we do my shorts or my other videos. Oh, the exercises, these live feed. Yeah, thanks, Max. That's kind of, you know, every time I'm doing a live feed, I'm kind of thinking of how can this, you know, what lesson does this teach? Um, <clears throat> or what can get people get out of it? Or what can I, like I said, I have so much footage, what can I extract from this later? For maybe like a little short how-to video or something like that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, practice on glass works great for pinstriping. All right. All right, three, two, one, cut into the next phase. Okay. All right, so for the next phase, what we're gonna be doing is we're gonna be doing these basic shapes. And if you've opened up any airbrush how-to book, drawing how-to, painting how-to, YouTube, uh, books, whatever, you're gonna come across these, okay? You're gonna come across these basic shapes. The sphere, the cylinder, the cube, the cone, this is a chrome cylinder, so it's a little bit different than a regular cylinder. And I'm going to add a five-pointed star here just to give that dimensional. Uh, and this all revolves around light, understanding how light bounces, how shading for three-dimensional shapes, um, you know, uh, core highlights, core shadows. Everything we're going to talk about was just going to make your ability to do artwork, whether it's portraits, graphics, flames, it's just going to bring life to them and bring dimension. It's going to pop them off the surface. They're not going to look flat and dead. I think the biggest thing, uh, a lot of airbrush artists that I've taught over the years got into it later in life. <clears throat> they didn't do a lot of drawing, so they didn't get these basics, so they struggle with getting that depth. Uh, you have to go back to those basics, one-on-ones, to really understand how light bounces. And it's very simple. And once you get it, all your other artwork, your graphics, your flames, your skulls, your cool stuff, whatever it is you do, portraitures, faces, women, men, whatever you're into painting, it's going to bring depth and dimension to it. So let's get started on these quick basic shapes and we're going to go from there. <clears throat> I do happen to have a few examples here of real world and these, you can kind of see what's going on. Um, I have these, I think I bought these off Amazon. These are great to point light at because you can actually see how they interact and shadow and in reality, 
you know, a sphere <clears throat> and a cube. I think the cube is probably one of the best the best references we're going to use today because it, you can see if you look at this cube, this isometric cube here, and I'm holding this in real life, it's brighter on top. It's darker, brighter purple on this side, and it's more gray on this side. This happens to do the lighting in the studio. And as I rotate it, that'll kind of change depending on what angle it's getting different light from, okay? So we're going to utilize this stuff for painting. And what I've done is there is a nice downloadable vector. And on the vector, I have these shapes cut out. I have a circle here. I have an isometric cube. I have a star. I have a cylinder. And I have the cone here. And I have this other window here. I'm going to show you how to do a louvered effect. <clears throat> the louvered effect will be a layering effect. Um, but... You could do all these shapes on your own. You don't need to download this. You know, you could use a compass for the circle. Um, you could cut your own isometrics. But what I did ahead of time is this is what we got. I did print everything on paper. And then I cut out some positives of all the different shapes you're going to be doing today. Because I can use these as counter masks or to show you you can do these by hand. You don't have to have a plotter to pre-cut this. Okay, well the first thing we're going to talk about today in the basics is some, is the ball, okay? Light on a ball. I see the most mistakes people make on this is they put the shadows too heavy to one side. Uh, they, they don't take into consideration the sphere or secondary lighting or things like that. So the first piece, I'm going to unmask off this one. Or if you're cutting it by hand, just get a compass out. And I got a circle. Now, what I'm doing here, um, just like when I'm using this isometric, I have a, a bright white top down light source coming from this side. From this side, there's actually a purplish light coming. And that's why it's purple. And this side is more of a secondary shadow. Okay, that's not getting light. That's why we're getting the three different tones. Um, so, we're going to talk about directional light sourcing later. But what I want to do is top down only, okay? I'll put it off to the side a little bit uh, so we have kind of a brighter source to one side. And what I'm doing for this is I'm using two colors. So just like my basics video um, where I was just using one airbrush, I'm using the same thing, just an eclipse. And I have a, a, I have a white reduced and mixed. And then I have a black, an illustration black mixed up, which what I'm using here is a color, a paint system called Createx Colors. These are their, uh, I'm using their opaque white, which the opaque white is what I'm going to use for my highlights. And then I'm using black illustration colors, which is a little bit finer grain paint. That's going to be a nice shadow and very nice atomization. And that one is, again, a little bit reduced more than normal because I want to do some soft shading and I want to be able to build. In other videos, I've talked about reduction and things like that, about how to get the flow. So, let me get a piece of paper here. Uh, there we go. Before I do it on the actual piece, light's coming down and hitting a, a sphere, okay? Which means there'll be a highlight like right there where the light's the strongest. And then, there's, then as right around here is like the midpoint, I know it looks like a Death Star, right around here is where you start bending in the shadows. And your core shadow will be down here, but it won't be all the way to the edge. The only time you would go all the way to the very edge of the mask like this is if you're doing like a space scene and there's absolutely no secondary light bouncing around the planet. 
from anything out there. It's just in darkness. Then you would go all the way to the edge. And when I do some other how-tos later on rivets and bullet holes and making things look radius and indented, this is going to be key to making things look believable. Okay? So you don't want to go all the way to the edge. You know, so if I had two circles like this, if it was not in space, you want the core shadow, highlight, and actually it's casting a shadow on the ground, like like here, basically, okay? If it was in space, you would go all the way to the edge, and then it could just black out, because there's no secondary bounce light bringing it bringing it back up. This is all, you know, basic drawing, um, airbrush 101s. This is kind of what we're doing here. That's kind of the principle of this, this whole download is. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start light. I'm going to build my tone and I'm radius. I'm kind of developing muscle memory for that stroke and I'm pulling lightly back on the trigger. I'm staying far away. And I'm fading that up, okay? See how I'm doing that? I might get a little bit towards the edge, but I'm not going 100%. Okay, I can go a little bit around the top, because that's kind of getting around the bend, but I'm not saturating it. Okay, and this is with the darker tone. Now, I'm going to use... I could just kind of let this be and just blend it, but this is going to be a two color process. Because I'm on gray, I can utilize two colors. So I'm going to use black and white. So what I'm going to do is, I'm going to take my white, I'm going to make sure I'm really reduced nice, and I'm going to do a nice strong highlight, but it's not going to be like, bam, it's just going to be a nice fade. I'm going to build it. Don't be afraid to build things up in a couple colors. And then I can get a little tighter. A little tighter, and a little tighter, okay? And I can kind of come back. If I got a lot going on, I can actually out here, and I've done this before, like if it's on a very shiny surface, I go about a quarter to an eighth inch away, and I just hit it. And when you unmask this, it'll be a little whiter and it'll look like that sphere is floating. And a lot of this is going to depend, we're going to have to go through this. Um, because what I'm going to do is I'm going to do each one and then I'm going to pull the whole background off into a counter mask and make the drop shadows or make everything kind of float. So you can do the same thing off here. And if you want, you could do a really harsher shadow right here. But you can already see that looks more radius than if we did the other things. That's basic sphere. If I could, you know, I probably can do. No, I'm gonna wait. So that's basic sphere shading, okay? We're gonna move on. Down here is a cylindrical shading. So cylindrical, it's got an oval here, and then the rest of it's here. So I'm gonna pull this off. And I'll pop the other one on screen. Let's see here. So you can see, I don't have the one I want. I will put that up in post-production, guys. Let's talk about cylindrical shading. Yeah, light bouncing off nice, exactly, light bouncing. So. Oops, sorry, I'm not supposed to be. This is for, for those just joining us. I'm trying to do this as I'm recording this live, but I'm gonna edit this down as if it's not live for how-to video uh, for future use, so we just have it. So I'm watching what you guys are saying and kind of trying to balance it at the same time. <clears throat> Cylindrical shading, okay? So that's basically this right here. It's kind of hard to show it because this is not metallic, this is soft light, so you'll see it's kind of getting the purple side light from here. And if you're looking at my multiple camera angles, you can see different camera angles show different things. So reality and perception are different things. It depends on the viewer, it depends on the point of view. 
So my top-down cam, you're seeing the bright purple on the side, and it's very washed out of this side. On my three-quarter cam, this looks much lighter purple because it depends on the angle of what how the light's hitting it because the light's refracting different angles. And if it's here, now looking at me, you can see it's very bright up top and shadows down the bottom. All right. Probably one of the best examples of cylindrical shading. And you have it in front of you all the damn time. I and mean, most people never notice it. Is your airbrush. Let's switch. I'm going to switch to my top down. Look at that. Perfect example of cylindrical shading. See where it's brightest? Across the center, just above just above center. And depending on the angle it changes, look at that highlight. And those colors change. And notice, look at this one. This is probably the greatest example I've gotten. So highlight, shadow, and look at the very top edge. It's brighter again. Because it's reflecting the light. You know the, the the core highlight is right here. There's a secondary highlight here, core shadow, and down here, look. So if it's not there, it's almost black to the bottom. Look what happens when I move my hand in position. You can see that bounce light coming up to this bottom. See that? And how it's reflecting. That's the key to chrome. That's the key to effects is by understanding light reflection, secondary and was it tertiary for third? You know, just multiple light sources coming in and converge different angles. So we're gonna do a very basic here. The same thing, I'm gonna run my core shadow across the bottom. Because it's below, that's gonna be the darkest part. I'm gonna take a break because I just read Dan Powers' comment. <coughs> I'm going to edit this out when I do the videos, but yes, that's exactly what I was thinking. So what I painted was true from a certain point of view, <laughs> which I knew as soon as I said point of view, I was thinking Obi-Wan. <laughs> but it's true. So this is, so this took me a while to wrap my head around that. Um, and I think Dan did this really good in his videos back in the day, and I'm sure his newer boot camp is going to talk about this a lot that you guys got to get on. Um, color is relative. So it's relative to what's around it, what's next to it, what's near it, what it's reflecting. Um, in this case, the angle. Okay, So this is not a white... This is a white piece of foam. But why is it purple? Well, because it's reflecting purple. So it's absorbing all the other colors but that purple. From this angle to this camera, I mean to the top-down camera, it's the camera's feeding getting the purple back. Everything else is being absorbed. All the other light is colors of the spectrum are being absorbed under the object, but the purple's coming back. From this camera here, the white is coming back. The purple's going off to the other camera, so therefore it's not going to that camera. Okay, so that is kind of a basic understanding of how light plays a part where this is only a white object because it's absorbing everything in the spectrum but from one camera it's kicking back purple the other camera it's picking back kicking back white so it, it it's all by point of view and now I'm gonna edit cut back to my how-to <coughs> three two one wait, wait, oh, I, I need a little clacker <laughs> so I have my core shadow down below. I could probably use a little extra reduction in my paint. Because I find it's a little thicker than I want it. So before I continue, I'm going to add a little bit more reducer to my paint. I've talked about reduction in other videos. So I'm not going to go over it too much in this. Ah, there we go. I could hear it. I could hear a pitch change. So I want it really soft down here, but I don't want to go all the way to the edge. And then just like I'm looking at this chrome, see how it's bright and then it's dark again? This is your core shadow. This is your, I want to say it's sec. I don't know the correct term for it. I'll have to look up. Like it's secondary shadow, but it's softer because the light's next to it. 
Okay, and I, I'm gonna probably put that, for painting purposes, I'm gonna go all the way to the edge. And I'm right to the very edge here, I'm gonna just downturn a little bit, like it's catching, like the edge is just a little radius. But I'm strongest down the bottom. And I can even go really harsh, like it's reflecting like the ground right there. And now, I'm gonna do a core highlight. So look at the airbrush. See that bright, bright part? That's my core highlight. That's the main highlight. That's just like this. Core highlight. Core highlight's gonna go right, right up, right up to the edge of this one. And we're gonna let it blend back down. And I'm gonna do another little light one. I've talked about other videos. My vent cap is a little clogged and I'm not getting the paint I want out of it. I'm gonna fix that, see that? Now it's gonna flow better. So it's just a little bit of highlight there. And I'm gonna give it a little secondary light down the bottom. And when I pull this off, we're gonna actually drop shadow it. But before I do that, I'm gonna make this a hole. Okay, so what I'm gonna do is, I pulled this off. I'm gonna give it a little bit more spray. Just soft, just a little bit. And this is where the paper comes into play. I could, I could plot it, and I could make this just a flat top, kind of like this. But I want to make it look like it's a, it's a tube. So we're gonna make it look like it goes in. So what I need to find is this section here. So I have this, this is my plot and my paper cut. So these line up almost exactly, okay? So what I'm gonna do is, I'm gonna take a knife and I'm just gonna do it off camera. I don't have my cutting mat up here. Actually, yes I do. <coughs> Let's go here. I'm going to take this. I'm just going to use a straight edge knife. You can use an X-Acto knife, whatever you want. I'm going to cut right in the middle of this line. Like I said, I could use a plotter and plot the other half. But I always use a mix of both. Okay. So now what I could do is watch this. I'm going to put this on the edge like this. I'm going to use the black, and now I'm going to flip it because the light's coming down from the top, so the shadow is bigger on this side. It's going to have another little radius shadow on this side here, but it's going to be darker here. And then it's just going to catch a little light. Down low. It's kind of got a radius a little bit. I want to make sure I just kind of cross this whole line. And they can be straight. And you get a nice kind of tubular effect. What I would probably normally do, I would probably put an edge on it and get a brighter edge, but you get the kind of point of that cylindrical shading. And you can actually, if you want to put a harsh edge, you can use a kind of a stencil soft and just kiss one edge and make it a little bit hard like that. And if you want to kind of sell the effect. 
You can give it a little gleam to one part of it. It's got to get that curl effect. But that gives you that understanding of basic cylindrical shading. And then when I pull the rest of this mask off, we get there, we'll drop shadow everything, and everything will just kind of pop off. Next one. The isometric cube. This is probably the most meaningful that we can see in reality. So there's that paper cube. Here's the reality of what we're going to try to match. Like that, okay? So see the different tones? we got a white up top. we got like a grayish kind of blue tone here. we got a purple tone here. I'm going to do this mostly in just the black and grays, but I'll show you all the different pieces. Uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to decide which is our darkest which is our darkest? This is this is brighter. This is the darkest side. So this is what I'm going to pull first. Where it talks about masking, um, if you're paper cutting or hand cutting, I work sequentially. And if you watch a lot of my videos, I use the word sequential quite a bit. Um, I try to mask in such a way that I remove, and I don't very rarely have to replace masking. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pull one. This is a great effect if you have a whole series of these. Uh, in the motorcycle industry, pattern making, um, there's a, great, a lot of great examples of this, and we're going to do some videos on that in the near future as well. So I want this side of the queue to be darker. So this is going to be my first hit, and I'm just going to fade across the whole thing even, but I'm going to get a little harsher. I'm kind of just flowing with it like this. Because the light's going to kind of come down because we're matching this angle here. This is going to be really white. It's really dark as the light continues over, but it's getting some secondary bounce back from everything here. So we're going to do one. Now I can pull this off. And this is where transparent paints come into play, or semi-transparents. Because with the same color, I can do the same thing on this side. And I can go back and forth. And what happens is this gets darker. So this is now, say, four coats. This is two. It'll always, it'll as long as you go that way, this will always stay darker than the rest. So simple, simple, simple. <clears throat> now I'm going to pull the top. And what I'm going to do is the same thing. I'm going to shatter on this whole piece. But I'm going to give the top the brightest. Now if I want to make it brighter because I, I have a gray this is where having a paper stencil helps. I can come across like this and I can make this leading edge Super bright. Whoops. Let me fix that. There we go. And really make that cube. And I can kind of come off the edge like this if I want and just give it a little bit. And really make it look like it's popping. Again, as I go through all these, these are really going to all make a lot more sense. And the last one of this, and the easiest one, is the cone. The cone is just a cylinder, and they get wide, this same effect, light's coming this way, so my core shadow will be darker on this side, but towards the base it will be wider, and then it'll, it'll come right to the point.
down here. And I'm going to do the same thing here. It's going to have a light shadow on this side. But that should converge. And now I want to do this bright highlight right on this side here. And it should get wider towards the base. We can do a nice harsh line. I'm going to give it just a secondary light off this side and off here. And you'll see that nice shading. Okay. Um, again, when I unmask these and what I, what I, you know what I'm going to do now. I'm going to grab a ruler here. <clears throat> Edit. Hi guys, hi honey. So you just came on. What I'm trying to do here is I'm editing this later. So I'm trying to keep the interaction to a minimum while I'm, while I'm in the middle of the lesson. Um, that I can cut back in as if... Um, this wasn't done live. So thank you for the super chat. You roll. For the live feed, this will stay in. For everything else, it'll go away. All right, before I get to the last two, I want to just kind of show you what I got going on here. So I'm just going to use my ruler here. My truler, actually, which is a... Very cool ruler by a nice company. I want to kind of show you these before I get to this, these last couple. So now when I pull these off, these should kind of, they're going to look three dimensional, but they're still going to look flat because there's no drop shadow. And this is the next point I want to talk about, is the drop shadow. The drop shadow is key to making something that's three-dimensional pop. So if you're doing graphical paint jobs or portraits or hard or soft objects that need to pop, getting the object itself three-dimensional is half the battle. Uh, the rest of it is getting it to remove itself from its background. So drop shadows or shadowing or just counter colors or different things to really get the pop is the key. So watch what I'm going to do here and you kind of see what I'm talking about. The reference material shows it. So you'll see how much more three-dimensional they look when I remove this bright blue mask. You can see they got a really cool three-dimensional effect. This is, is floating, but it's floating nowhere, okay? So you don't know if this is floating or if it's on a surface. Now, I wish I could do this twice, and I, I will do a future video, and it'll probably be for more members. It'll be more in-depth. Um, the membership videos will include multiples of like one thing. We're going to make the sphere float. We'll make it on a surface, we'll make it in space, we'll do different things with just a sphere. Um, so we're going to do a traditional, basically it's a ball that's going to be on the ground. And I'm just going to use this piece of paper I cut. I want to create a nice shadow. And what I'm going to do for a shadow, it's just going to come off the bottom. And you'll see the change happen just by this, if I did it right, okay? See the difference that makes? The difference that makes is astronomical because now you can see the secondary bounce light because the shadow on this side now sells this, that this ball is sitting on a surface. Now, if I want to put an edge of a table here, like, and make it darker, I could. There's a lot of tricks I could do, but just that alone gives it that weight. 
if I do the same thing with the cylinder here, you'll see the same effect happen. I probably should have come a little further. Yeah, let me come off this whole end. Now the cylinder actually floats off a little bit better. And we'll do the same thing for this, the, the triangle, the cone. Same deal. The shadow kind of helps sell the effect. The cube's going to be the same thing. And I really kind of want to wait till I pull this. So let's do that. Um, before I do the cube shadow, I will do the star and what I have planned here. The louver effect. So I'm just going to cover this up for now. Yeah, I could do the magnet on the paper, uh, but this is an aluminum panel and it's pretty thick, so it's not going to really do as well for me. But if it was a steel, it would definitely do that. All right, so now we're going to do the... This is going to be simpler. Let's do a layering effect. Nope, let's scratch that. Let's scratch that. Blah, 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 blah. Don't talk to me in the mouthful. Thanks. <laughs> Hold on, I need some water. All right, we're going to do the star. So you'll see the star, the example, in the reference image below. The light source is a little flipped on this, so I'm going to kind of play with it a little bit different. Um, the way the light source is coming down, it's kind of coming down. We're going to come just at the same angle. So it's going to be the way the star is. And I'll show you here. This is kind of how it's set up. It's going to be white. It's going to be a shadow. The light's coming across white. Shadow. Light's still coming across. So it's going to be white, but a little darker than this one because it's not catching as much because of the angle. Shadow. Shadow. But I need a separation. White. Shadow. White. But you want a little difference, okay? Just because the angle, these are going to be white and white dark and dark but you need separations okay so I find it easiest when you're doing something like this oh I might be I'll edit this out I might be, I might have had the razor in my mouth <laughs> oh, shit All right, so for reference, I know it's kind of hard to see here, but when you do it yourself, you can see the cuts just fine. Uh, I'm going to do this with shadow. I think it's going to be easier that way. So I'm going to go by darkest couple. When they don't touch, I can pull them both off at once. So I can actually pull these off all at once. So I can pull this one, this one, and this one. And just remember which is going to be darker. And then I can pull this one. That's going to be a little lighter. I'm going to pull this one. These are the ones you got to pull first to make the darkest piece. So, what I do with this, I'm going to miss the whole area. So it's all kind of toned in, okay? I'm going to come across and make this darkest there. But let it start catching a little secondary light. You can come up a, lo a little bit with the white if you want, but it's not necessary. You can always do that after as well. 
This one will get dark. This one will get dark. But notice, I'm not just flooding it with black. I'm just doing a couple light passes, letting it become really dark at the actual break point. And this top one is going to be light, the lightest of them all because it's going to be catching the most secondary light here. And then what I'll do... Now I can catch this one. And just like the cube... I can hit this one. And it gets a little light. And now, as I pull off, these two here are very close to each other. So this is what I do. I go here. I pull that off. And what I can do, because I have a corresponding mask, it's very easy. I can just cut one section of this. And now what I can do is I can hit this side really bright and not take away any of my black. And I can make that bright. And now I can pull this off. And I can kind of keep doing the same thing. I can keep rotating this stock and flip it over. And I can keep utilizing this edge. And just getting a little bit. And now that it's all there. I can pull off all the other pieces. And kind of balance everything out between black and white and really get that three dimensional effect. So here I can keep rotating this and I can get that star centered. If it's on steel and you really want to be technical, you could use a magnet or I could use tape and hold it down on the edges and just kind of hit those. And I can do some slight reflections if I want. And just keep rotating this through. And just balancing it out. And I usually soft shade the middle. And you'll get that nice three dimensional pop. Okay. Now, the last and final piece I want to do before we finish this basic tutorial on shading is how to do a louvered effect or like a if you ever looked at armor and I was actually recently at a museum I was recently at a museum and there was these really cool gauntlets and you saw the armor how it's like overlapped on each other and it creates that really cool layered effect um, really gives dimension so I want to talk about a nice quick down and dirty way to do a louvered effect. Uh, this effect worked with fish scales, which if you looked at my lowrider videos, that's why I did the, the, the blah, blah, blah. That's why I did the lowrider, the fish scales, uh, and the fan pattern and things like that. So this is the same premise, just done in a different way. Uh, you can just do straight across and make louvers almost like, uh, like uh, blinds, Phoenician blinds in your house, same effect. But this, I'm gonna give it a little bit of a twist so it's got a little bit of you know, hard edge um, armor effect to it. So what I did, I cut out this cube, 
just this rectangle. And I made this piece of paper. It almost looks like a book. So I folded it in half. And I measured out where it lines up right here. Okay. What I'm also going to do is I'm going to take a ruler. And I'm going to measure. I'm going to do every like half inch. Yeah, maybe I'll do just one inch, keep it simple. I'm going to go up one inch for each one. I'm going to mirror it on this side. And that's going to tell me how much to move my paper. And I'll show you how simple drop shadows really create a three-dimensional louvered effect. Very simply. Then we can use the same stencil. Basically what I did to make it even, I folded it in half, I cut the shape on both sides, I cut the shape, then I moved it up and I cut the shape so it was, it, they match each other. Okay, now I marked it, so I'm going to go here, like this. I'm going to tape it. And I'm just going to hold it down. You can actually use a pencil if the airbrush is too much and just kind of make sure it stays down. And I'm just going to kind of go right across even. And I'm going to go heavier here and I'm going to radius it down. Just like I was doing the star. A couple passes. Okay. Now I'm going to go up. I'm going to do it again. Keep it centered. Same thing. Shade it. Just like that. Now do it again and repeat. It's a very simple louver. I did this on the front of a motorcycle with like rivets up the side ones and it looked like just, you know, armor. Now I'm going to come up the other side with white. And make the highlights. And So I'm going to get that nice and dark there. Then I'm just going to take the edge of our conventional piece of paper. I want to make these look rays in the middle with our light source. So I want this side is going to be darker. So I'm just going to lightly kiss that side. And you can already see that cool lured effect, but we'll make it one better. And I'm going to just hit one side. And I'll reshadow that. Let's take the tape off. And obviously, the more time you spend. And care and making sure everything's lined up. You can sell this effect really big. Just like that. And you get that really cool three-dimensional effect. I think I'm going to pop this out a little bit more right here. 
I'm going to follow the metal and maybe we'll uh, do a little something cool effect here. These are stencil called texture effects. We'll cover these in other videos. We're just going to give it a little bit of rough texture there. And we'll sell the whole shading like it's in a window. And we can even put a little battle damage scar. Little dagger strokes. Just to sell it like it's been used and hit a few times. It's endless. But it'll have a really, really cool effect. We'll make it nice and dark. We'll drop shadow this. We'll pull this off. And that will conclude the basic shading lessons. So what I'm going to do now is that star looks cool. You can see it looks like it's just kind of blending into the background. This looks like it's in a window. It's coming out. Looks cool. Everything has a cool shading effect to it. I want to pop some shadows off this. I want to go with the shape of a star roughly. Like it's popping off a little bit. Just softly get it to pop off that surface. Sorry if I'm in the way camera wise. And we'll freehand shadow the pointed stars like it's floating. And you can see you get that nice three dimensional effect. And we're going to get that cube. We'll get this cube in here. Use a couple of magnets, it should get through to my steel board. And we will not fade to black. We can actually use some edges so that will come off here. The shadow. Get that to pop. And see, get that cube. Just pop off. I'm going to go around this whole edge. Of this panel, this will be a nice panel to keep around the shop here. For my Airbrush Basics 101 workshop piece. This accompanies the basic airbrush strokes. And I have a couple other ones planned, but I'm not going to get to them tonight because it's already after 10 o'clock. Um, we'll do this in the next videos. I got old pans. I think the next lessons we will do some sheet metal rivets, some bullet holes, some battle damage, and maybe like a World War II bomber style uh, open mouth effect. I think that'll be the next tutorial to keep it out, keep an eye out for. Um, but I think this gives you a nice idea on how to use shading to pull off three dimensional depth. And this is as far as, you know, this is kind of the basics. There's a lot of room for improvement. You could come in here and effects like this and do like horizon effects and give it more of a chrome 
look by adding which basically reflections the ball the same thing I could add like a reflection to it we'll cover this in future videos something that's a little bit more in depth how to make something look chrome and just how little little corrections and little additions sell the effect and make things look chrome. So stay tuned for more videos, like and subscribe and all that fun stuff. And we will keep doing more Airbrush Down Nerd Hurts videos. We got an exciting year coming up. Uh, a lot of great videos, a lot of good uh, sharing with some other platforms we're gonna be working on. So keep staying tuned, like, subscribe, share, all that fun stuff. Message me on Facebook, Instagram, things you'd like to see, ideas for the future, and we will make sure to make them happen. I want to thank everyone for popping in and watching these videos and my live feeds and re-watching them on the replay. And we will see you all in the next video. Have a good one. Fade to black. That's going to edit it out. <clears throat> all right, guys. Thank you for watching tonight's feed. I think I got enough footage. I could probably make a handful of videos out of these, I believe. I think it'll be pretty good. Um, so let me know what you guys think. Message me. And uh, I think it worked out pretty good. I think we ended up with a pretty good uh, amount of things to look at. What do you guys think? I think between the airbrush maintenance, I have a whole bunch of other ones. Uh, I think we got a lot to go with now. I got a lot of editing to do. And uh, but I think video quality wise and the subject matter, I think it worked out pretty good. I do plan on doing, I want to get to bullet holes. I, I got almost through it, almost through the list. So, bullet holes and rivets, uh, and metal plating were the next ones. So, I'll either do those on a live feed or I'll do a quick video of those and then I will do uh, a live feed featuring like an object. So, um I hope you all had a good evening. Thank you so much to everyone who super chatted. Um, you know, I got to you guys late on the response just because I want to be able to edit out so it doesn't look like this was live. Um, I think this was just a really good way for me to do it in one shot. Because if I tried to do these without doing them live, I'd probably spend way too long on each one of these and they'd be a snooze fest. So I wanted to have each one work pretty quick. And then in future videos, we can expand on these. I think that's going to be the plan. So uh, see you guys all next Thursday. And hope you all have a nice week. Enjoy life, painting, creation. And I'll see you guys in the very near future. See ya.